You're watching Unrendered on IKTV. I'm Tony Redisford, and I'm chatting with Joseph Reds Pereira, affectionately known as Reds. Reds, welcome to St. Vincent, and welcome to the studios of IKTV. Well, thank you very much, and very nice to be invited. Of course, saying welcome to St. Vincent is really not indicative of the frequency at which you come here. You probably don't need a welcome by now. <laughs> well, I used to come here for cricket. Yes. And I continued to come here for cricket, and then, of course, I... Um, joined the OECS, mm -hmm. and I came much more often. I will come six times a year, or the case may be. Um, and I did that round of visits to every other OECS, OECS or maybe more sometimes, depending yeah. on the planning, depending on who's hosting events. Well, you've been quite a globetrotter anyway, because as a cricket commentator, and we'll put into the program, we'll get in to talk about that, but as a cricket commentator, you would have traveled fairly much to all the countries that have hosted cricket, major cricketing events anyway. I was maybe simply the best answer, except Bangladesh. So you've never been to Bangladesh? No. But every, every, all other cricketing um, yes, nations. Yes. You're from Guyana, and Guyana, in your time of growing up, was still is a very significant part of the, the whole Caribbean makeup. Um, it must have been then, though, in the 40s and 50s, um, a significant economic force. I'm not saying it isn't today, but I'm just trying to contextualize the time that you grew up. When you grew up, I believe the currency of Guyana was... The equivalent of of the rest of the Caribbean. Right. King Sugar. I grew up in King Sugar. Mm -hmm. The guy who was producing sugar. The Canadians were into bauxite. Yes. In my own situation, of course, there was gold and diamonds all the time. Mm -hmm. My own situation, my father was a farmer. Right. And we lived in the Essequibo region. And I live in one of the smaller rivers or on this one of the smaller rivers called the Pomeroon. So the Pomeroon is like a tributary to yes, the Essequibo. It's way up like as if you, you're going off to Trinidad. Okay. And um, we lived on the Savannah side, and he was a farmer. Mm. Coffee, um, citrus, avocados, you, you name it. Mm. Grung, you know, it was a land of plenty. And it was a very humble life. We had no fancy... Um, supporting cars in the house. My mother cooked a wood fire. Is that so? I, my bathroom was the river. We would scrub mm. our skin with mm. coconut husk. And they, when you eat the corn, you wouldn't throw it away. Right. Water. That, that would be a uh, Salt soap yes. around the neck. Yes. And that was it. You, you, know, you, you hardly wore shoes. Kerosene lamp. I grew up kerosene lamp at night before you turn in about 8 o'clock. By that time, they the nets will be done. And then you're up next morning, country life, you know. You, you got to go and do your chores. You got to open the fowl pen. Mm -hmm. You got to go and feed the pigs. And then you go off to a little primary school called Martindale. Right. Which um, was started by Dave Martin's grandfather. Mm. Well, my grandfather, who is Dave Martin's father. Right. Um, and that's how the school was a community school. And you had to walk on the bank of the river. Yeah, and you went to school and you walked back. But how you weren't afraid of snakes or right. anything like that, you know. How much of growing up next to the river impacted your life in terms of your mode of getting around, recreation, that sort of thing? The river must have been a significant yeah. um, influence or factor in, in how you grew up. The means of transport. Yes. But you have to know the river. You have to know when to go. You, know, you have to judge the tides. Right. If the tide is falling, you don't go against the tide. If the tide is washing, the water is coming up, I mean, the sea is coming in, you go with the tide. Yeah. Um, and you, you, will, you will make your, your, your visits wherever you're going uh, in terms of the tides. Um, at night, when the water, when the, the, the river's high, you can hear the river. You can hear it hitting the shores. It has a lovely, lovely soothing, song, yes. yeah, soothing song, you know. Yes. 
and when it's falling, it, it has a different kind of sound, you know. It has a, a flow out. Um, but the river, you know, we fished, we swam, right. we sailed, you know. What about the dangers of the river? Did you have, does Ghana have crocodiles or alligators or both? Um, crocodiles. So you have crocodiles. Yeah. You've been exposed to crocodiles in your growing up days? Seen a couple. Seen mm. a couple in my time. Um, but they, they, they're not, they're, they're not the, so much in the river. They're more in, 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 in the, the swamp area. Yeah. Right, right, right. But as a boy growing up, it was crocodile. It was alligator. You know, it, it was all kinds of story. Right. I read in my school days a book called Shack. It was about a guy, uh, you know, a boy who was growing up along the banks of one of your rivers, may have yeah. been the Essequibo. And it spoke about the dangers of crying a fish. Um, people falling over from a boat and just a white, foamy um, event and blood and nothing left. Is that just myth? Is it? No, no. That is for another part of the world. We don't have that man eating kind of um, fish. Yes. The piranhas will bite you. I've read, I've heard of the piranhas biting people. Yes. They lose a couple of toes, the back of the leg or something. But growing up where we did, in our, our grant, as they call it, now and ever, we never had a, any problems with piranha biting anybody. Mm. But one thing we never would go and throw food into the river. My mother will never throw after she cooked or anything. Cooked like or clean a chicken. Right. No blood, no no meat. That's a no no. Um, why when there is activity, motorboats coming in and going out, people splashing water, you do not get the piranhas. And that is what existed when we were growing up. Okay, I see. Yeah. But if it's still you're looking for trouble. If you're throwing meat, you're looking for trouble. When people hear about the size of the Essequibo, and to put it to scale, you know, you've got islands as big as Barbados, big as St. Vincent in the Essequibo. That is a massive river. I mean, you know, we're not talking the sort of streams that we have here in St. Vincent. Well, the mouth of the Essequibo it's 20 miles wide, mm. 20 miles wide. You can fit a lot into that. I've seen it, I've been through it, you know. It is powerful, mm. especially when, when, when the river is, when the tide is going out, it's powerful. Yes. The currents are massive. I've been across the Escobar, but going maybe closer where the, uh, the, the, the width is, is a lot narrower. Yes. You, you come across the river, go to Purica, you take a boat, and you crisscross around the islands, and you go to Supernam, mm. and then you, you cross, and you then take the car down to Charity, mm -hmm. which was like the New York when I was growing up. Going to yeah. Charity, you saw the police station. Yes. There was a telephone. You would see a bus, you know, you know it's going somewhere. You know, somewhere beyond, there's another life. Mm -hmm. And the case may be. What got you interested in sport, Reds? You know, I obviously spent quite, quite a lot of time outdoors growing up, as a lot of Caribbean people did in other islands in that era. Yeah. But what really got you um, hooked into sport in the way that has formed your life today, shaped your life today? I think that really happened when I came to primary school in Georgetown. My father put us on a boat. He had a boat called the Joan Patsy, which is named after my two sisters. Mm -hmm. Joan and Patsy. He built a schooner by himself. He was a wasn't an educated man in a sense, but he was a practical man. He was a, a man who a real man man. And he he, he built a, a schooner. He built a two, we call it Acme was the second one. Mm -hmm. But it was a two mast schooner called the Joan Patsy. It had a you know mainsail, jib, foresail, sail beautifully, forty four um, Kelvin diesel. And we sailed to Georgetown, my life started in the city, seeing street lights and seeing traffic and seeing donkey carts yes, and, you know, yes. shops and stores and, you know, pavements. And um, went to primary school. And it was at primary school, we, 
I started to play a little bit of cricket. Right. St. Mary's RC had a had a, um, a team, and a very, one famous schoolmate of mine, still alive, George De Pina. Mm -hmm. He became a runner, a marathon runner. He went to he went to Rome. He, he went to the Pan Am Games. He went mm -hmm. to a lot of events. He's still alive, and he lives in Trinidad. And of course, he joined the trade union movement. He was heavily involved in trade union yes. movement. We played together. That is when my interest started, and I started, of course, to form little teams in my own area, and I formed little football teams by my own area, and I listened a lot. At the age of, what, 11, I sat up every night and listened to Radio Australia right. when the West Indies toured, when Lindwall and Miller, you know, was maybe just too good for us, and um, we struggled against Lindwall and Miller. But I, I listened to each and every test match on the short wave. I started to listen. 1950, I was listening to John Arlott and Rex Alston, Raman right. Val and the mm. three W's. And I became interested in, in broadcasting. But I was still playing. Yes. I played club cricket. But I realized very soon, Tony, I was not going to be no wonder boy. Right. So I found my niche. But I had a difficulty. So you went into sports broadcasting. Tell me about the difficulties that you're talking about in getting in, breaking I into that field. I stammered yes. very badly, Tony. Mm. I was an extrovert. Nobody stammered in my family. Yes. I'm one of nine, the only one who lives in the Caribbean. I had red hair. I stammered. That's where you got any reds from. Yes. But I, was, I had a very loving mother. I was not brutalized as a child. I just had a stammering problem, which was... Oh, beyond, beyond anything you can dream about. I couldn't go to a party at the age of 16 and ask a girl to dance because yes, by the time I said... Chewed would be finished. Not can call to stop thing. <laughs> Reds, we're at the end of this um, first segment of the program. So let's just take a pause. When we come back, we'll just pick up that little sure. chronological sequence sure, through your sure. life. This is unrendered, and my guess is... Joseph Reds Pereira, more with Joseph Reds Pereira when we come back.